Genesis chapter 37. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. So, there is now developing a strained relationship between Joseph and his brothers. Because of Jacob and his love for Rachel, when Joseph was born, he almost became immediately a favored son kind of a status. And no doubt Jacob indicated his favoritism towards Joseph all the way along. And now Joseph is 17 years old. And he's out as the, all of the boys were engaged in the industry of shepherding. But his brothers have been goofing off and Joseph is the tattletale. He comes and he tells his dad what his brothers are doing, which, of course, never endears you with your brothers. Uh, it's always hard to have a brother who is a narc. And, uh, <laughs> so, that's just thrown in there. It, it, it just, the Scripture, verse 2, is just sort of thrown in there, uh, I think, to just give us a little bit of the insight why his brothers really began to resent him and hate him. He was Mr. Good Guy, and they were bad guys, and, and he was telling on them, and he was bringing their evil report to his dad. He was reporting on them to their dad, and so uh, that is surely going to bring resentment against Joseph, which, of course, it did. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, in the Hebrew, this particular phrase, uh, they uh, didn't know quite how to translate it and this idea of coat of many colors pretty much came from Martin Luther uh, and his endeavor to translate the Hebrew phrase. But since that time of the King James translation and the discovery of more ancient records, it is now believed that this should have been translated, made him a sleeveless coat. And that would seem to be a more accurate translation of this particular difficult Hebrew phrase. Now, the connotation of a sleeveless coat was that of rulership. The rulers wore sleeveless kind of, uh, or rather a coat with sleeves is what it should be. And I'll get there in a minute. Uh, the sleeveless coats were worn by the laborers and the rulers wore the coats with sleeves because the coat with sleeves, you really couldn't do much work in those. And so it indicated more of an aristocracy, uh, a rulership class, not a workly, working class, to have a coat with sleeves. The sleeveless coat was the worker's coat. And so when his dad made him a coat with sleeves, it was giving a definite message to his brothers of Jacob's intention of making Joseph the ruler. And uh, that was the intention of Jacob. It really did not come about by Jacob's devices, but later did come about by God's devices. 
But Jacob in the 49th chapter, which is a classic chapter, gives the reasons why the other brothers of Joseph really uh, did not inherit uh, the place of blessing as did Joseph. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his other brothers, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably unto him. Uh, real problems arose there in the family of sibling rivalry, of hatred, and uh, their inability now to, to even say a kind word to him. So, Joseph, no doubt, was suffering much from the um, attitude and the actions of his older brothers. Can you imagine having ten older brothers that uh, were sort of jealous of you because of your position. Our daughter Cheryl had two older brothers and barely survived <laughs> because they thought that she had a favored position, which she probably has had. I wouldn't doubt or deny that totally. But uh, she suffered much at the hands of her brothers because of their supposed at least favored position that they thought that she had within the family just because she rules it. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, Joseph had to go through with ten older brothers, all of them feeling resentment towards him, none of them able to really speak a kind word to him. And you can imagine all of the things that they did to antagonize him and to torment him, you know, tripping him and giving him an elbow now and then and all of those things that just really made life quite miserable for Joseph. But even to compound the problems, Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told his brothers, and they hated him even more. For he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream that I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in a field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood up straight. And behold, all of your sheaves stood round about and did obeisance. They bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. Very sharp contention there. He dreamed yet another dream. And he told his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And he told it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that, you've have, that you have dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father observed the same. Jacob tucked it away in the back of his mind probably wondering just what is going to happen. What significance is there to this? This particular dream of Joseph helps us in the understanding of the book of Revelation. For in the book of Revelation, it goes into a allegorical type of References in the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation where John saw a woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the twelve stars who was about ready to bring forth a child. The woman of the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation is identified by this dream 
to be the nation Israel. To try to give to the woman any other identity is to speculate only and it's unscriptural speculation. There are many today who, in order to try to prove that the church is going to go through the great tribulation, identify the woman as the church. But there is no scriptural kind of foundation to try to make the woman the church because nowhere is the church described as having the sun and the moon and the twelve stars surrounding it. And they make the man-child that comes forth from the woman sort of a super saints who are caught up during the midst of the great tribulation period. But that is surely a straining of the text and not a natural scriptural flowing. The woman of chapter 12, because of the identification, must be the nation Israel. And as I have pointed out in the book of Revelation, if the woman is the church, she's in serious trouble because she's pregnant and just about ready to have a child. And Paul speaks of the church as a chaste virgin and he wanted to present the church as a chaste virgin unto Christ, certainly not as a pregnant mother. So uh, it strains the interpretation of the church that much, uh, trying to make the woman in Revelation the church, it strains it that much more. But here gives cause to identify, and surely the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. And the Bible is an amazing commentary on the Bible. It's amazing how many of the things in Genesis are explained further in the Scriptures or how <clears throat> even amplified further in the Scriptures. So, uh, the best commentary you can ever buy on the Bible is just the Bible itself. Comparing Scripture with Scripture. So his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. They probably figured, we're getting out of here. He's nut with his dreams and all and can't stand him. And we'll head for Shechem, which was about 67 miles away from where they were staying there in the area of Hebron. And Israel said to Joseph, do not your brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it is well with your brothers and well with their flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, Who are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Tell me, I pray thee, where are they feeding their flocks? And the man said, they are departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, hey, here comes the dreamer. So, uh, Surely Joseph nor his father had any idea that the brother's hatred had grown to this extent. Else his father would have never sent him. And Joseph probably but it would have been reluctant in going. But coming to Dothan or coming to Shechem and not finding them, he was just sort of roaming in the field. I would imagine that he was looking for evidences, probably trying to uh, find a trail, looking for uh, the footprints of the flocks and so forth, and, and just going back and forth through the field, trying to find the trail, trying to find out which direction they may have gone. And as he was just sort of wandering in the field, looking for evidences of where they might be, this man 
said, who are you looking for? And he said, uh, do you happen to know where my brothers have gone with their flocks? And they, he said, yeah, I heard one of them say they're going to Dothan. So he headed out 20 miles further north to Dothan. And so he's now almost 90 miles away from home. And his brothers seeing him come conspired together to kill him. They said, come now therefore, let us kill him. We'll cast him into a pit and we'll say some evil beast must have devoured him and we will see then what will become of his dreams. Showing the deep resentment they had towards his dreams. The very idea that they would bow down to him uh, will thwart really the plan of God. See what happens to God's plans after we kill him. Uh, of course, there are many who see in Joseph a beautiful type of Jesus Christ. And uh, Satan's endeavor to destroy Jesus to see what could become then of God's plans. And uh, of course, God's plans were fulfilled in the death of Christ. Reuben heard it, the oldest brother. And he delivered him out of the hands and said, hey, let's not kill him. Reuben said unto them, don't shed blood. Let's just throw him in this pit that is here in the wilderness. And don't lay any hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Now, Reuben being the oldest brother would be then the one who would be most responsible. He would be the one that would be responsible to his dad for his youngest brother. And so, seeing that these guys were really serious in their intention to kill him, he, he felt that it was his responsibility to save him from their anger and so he suggests an alternate plan. Don't kill him. Just throw him in the pit. Let him starve to death. And that way you don't get your hands bloody. And you won't have his blood on your hands. You just let him die there in the pit. And he was intending to come back around later and to let Joseph out of the pit and, and deliver him back safe to his father. Joseph would have been safe around his father. It came to pass when Joseph was come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Even as they stripped Jesus of his robe and cast lots. And they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So, it indicates that it was probably a cistern. Now, all over that land, uh, they have dug these huge cisterns in the rock, which are water reservoirs. And uh, some of them uh, have were dug in an area where there was a uh, fracture in the rock and, and they would not hold water. So, uh, here was a cistern. It was empty. They usually, all of them have very steep sides. And so they decided to dump Joseph in the cistern. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother in our flesh and his brothers were content. Now whether or not it was Judah's desire to save his life or to make money is only a matter of speculation. Uh, but he is suggesting that they again not actually kill him. They could actually make some money off of him. What profit is it to kill him? Let's just sell him and we'll make money off of him. And how pure were Judah's motives uh, or well-intentioned as far as Joseph is concerned is only speculation. We really uh, don't know for sure. Then there passed by the Midianite merchantmen and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And so he is rejected by his brethren, 
and sold. Even again in the typology as Christ was rejected by his brethren and uh, was sold for 30 pieces of silver by Judas Iscariot. Now at this point, Jacob was really, I mean Joseph was really crying and pleading with his brothers uh, that uh, they would uh, have mercy on him and all. And uh, his brothers uh, just really turned a deaf ear uh, unto his pleas. And uh, later on in, in the book of Genesis, it, it tells how that his uh, brothers, when he was playing games with them in Egypt and putting pressure on them, uh, said, you know, uh, this is really our fault. We didn't uh, have mercy on our brother in the 42nd chapter, verse 21. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he begged us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And so, uh, going just a little bit ahead in the story, uh, when Joseph became the ruler in Egypt, and his brothers came down to buy grain, they did not recognize Joseph. Of course, some 20 years had transpired. Joseph was just 17 years old when his brothers sold him. He was 30 years old when he uh, came to Pharaoh. And he was seven years of the famine I mean, of the feast, or the, the, the plentiful years, so uh, he was at least 20 years older since his brothers last saw him. And he was now uh, older, matured, and uh, had no doubt the style of, of hair and beard and so forth as the Egyptians. And uh, they didn't recognize that this was their brother, but he recognized them, but didn't let them know. Uh, who he was, spoke to them through an interpreter. But he started giving them a bad time. He said, you guys are spies. You're not brothers. You come down here to spy out Egypt. I had to put you all to death, you know, and, and just was giving them a bad time. And, and so uh, he was giving them such a rough time, they started talking to each other in Hebrew, not knowing that he could understand. And they said, hey, hey, you know. And it, it shows you that you can't get away from your guilt. You may bury it down in the recesses of your mind, or you might try to sublimate it. But guilt will out. Somewhere or other, guilt will out. It'll out in a neurotic behavior pattern, or it will out in some form or other. Guilt will out. There's only one thing that can remove your guilt. And that is confession to Jesus Christ and receiving his forgiveness. That's the only thing that can remove your guilt. And so the brothers, 20 years later, are still feeling guilty over the act that they did. This is caused because we saw the anguish of his soul and we didn't give any heed to it. So Joseph was really begging them, pleading with them, no doubt crying. And yet they were heartless. They were hard. And as he was being carried away in this caravan, probably chained to the other slaves, looking back, pleading, crying, don't do this. And they, they didn't have any compassion upon him whatsoever. So later Reuben, now Reuben evidently had gone off someplace while the brothers conspired to sell him. Reuben came back to the pit and saw that it was empty. And he tore his clothes and he returned to the other brothers and he said, the child isn't in the pit and I don't know what I'm going to do. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat 
with long sleeves and brought it to their father and said, We have found this coat. Do you know whether or not it is your son's coat? And he knew it and he said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. And Jacob tore his clothes and put on sackcloth. And he mourned for his son for many days. And all of the sons and all of the daughters, daughters plural, so he had other daughters, only one is named. They rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. And thus the father wept for him. Jacob, the deceiver, deceiving his brother, or actually deceiving his father to get his brother's blessing, ends up being deceived. Deceived by his father-in-law Laban and now deceived by his own sons. Notice the sons didn't say anything about it. They, they let the old man come to his own conclusions. They just brought him a butt bloody coat and said, do you recognize this? Do you, did, it, does it happen to belong to your son? And they let their dad just jump to the conclusions that an animal must have killed his son. Joseph is no doubt torn in pieces. And, and they let him jump to that conclusion and then let him believe it. But they were deceiving him. And so again, he who deceived ends up being deceived. Now, ver the last verse seems to belong uh, more... Uh, well, it just closes off this chapter and then chapter 38 is just sort of a separate little story all on its own. The Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer. The word officer here in Hebrew literally is eunuch, a eunuch of Pharaoh's and the captain of the guard. Now chapter 38 is just thrown in to give us a little bit of historic background concerning the ancestry of Jesus Christ. For even as marvelous a person as Joseph was, his was not to be the blessing of having the Messiah come through him. The Messiah was to come through the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Joseph. And so, God by His own election and choice, choosing the tribe of Judah that it might be by grace and not by works, shows us a little insight into Judah and the fact that the ancestry of Christ isn't really a pure kind of an ancestry. There are several insertions into the ancestry of Jesus that if we were choosing a family background for our own son, we probably wouldn't have chosen. But in order that he might be fully identified with each of us, God did not choose a perfect lineage to bring him from, but imperfect in order that we might feel an identity. Now it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and he turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua and he took her and went in unto her. Now customarily, if you wanted to get a wife, you'd have your father go ahead and arrange a dowry. You have a big ceremony and everything else. Judah uh, didn't bother to go through all of this. He just went down, uh, saw this gal, Shua. She was probably a nice-looking girl. And he just uh, decided that uh, let's just go ahead and, and uh, you be my wife. We'll just live together. And so he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chezib, 
when she bare him. Now that's only about eight miles from Hebron. Judah took a wife. Uh, she conceived, actually bore three sons, Ur, Onan, and finally uh, Shelah. Now, the interesting thing is that Judah was to be the father or in the ancestry of Jesus Christ. But Shua wasn't evidently God's choice for his wife. It was Judah's own willful choice. He just saw the gal, was attracted to her. They started living together and they had three sons. But it wasn't in the plan of God that Shua should be the mother of those descendants that would bring forth the Christ child. And thus Judah's action was no doubt out of the plan and will of God. I would imagine that she was a Canaanite she was attached to her Canaanite gods. Judah maybe thought that he could convert her to Jehovah. She evidently wasn't converted because the last two sons are named with Canaanite names. Judah no doubt named the first son Hebrew name, but the last two are Canaanite names, which means that she began to have a stronger and stronger influence. Now, Judah knew that from his uh, seed there was to come one day the Messiah, and thus, uh, he went out and he made arrangements for his son to marry this girl whose name was Tamar. So he took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, verse 7, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord and the Lord slew him. Now, it is interesting, it doesn't tell us what his wickedness is, nor does it tell us how God killed him. But God did not want this son, born of Shua, to be in the line of the Messiah. So before this son of Shua could have a child, because of his own wickedness, God killed him. Now, a part of the code in those days was that if your brother died before he had a son, then it was the obligation of the next oldest son to take that same woman as a wife and the first son would be named after the dead brother. And this later became incorporated as a part of the Jewish law, but it was already the code uh, in the earlier laws of Hammurabi and others. It is there as a part of the codes of the earlier laws. It was already an accepted practice and was later incorporated into the Mosaic law. And so Onan, the next brother in line, was to take Tamar as a wife and bear a son. And he went in unto Tamar. But it said he spilled his seed on the ground and so God killed him. Now, there are those that would seek to use this particular text as a text against masturbation. But it is not at all for that reason that God slew Onan. It is interesting that the Bible really says nothing about that particular practice. Some use this for an argument against coitus interruptus, but again, it isn't that at all for which God slew him. The reason that God slew him was his failure to be obedient to the law that God had established of raising up a seed for the dead brother. It was a rebellion against that established law of God for which God slew him. Now, as far as these other two things, the Bible is completely silent. And where the Bible is silent on a subject, we must remain silent. And just 
take certain Scriptures such as Romans the 14th chapter and let that be the criteria of judgment. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. As far as birth control in the family's exercise of birth control, methods of birth control or something, that is something that each family must work out. The Bible doesn't actually cover or deal with these issues. Where the Bible doesn't deal specifically with the issues, then we just have to take where the Bible deals with the non-specified issues. And that is that each person has to be convinced in their own mind of what is right and what is wrong. And thus each couple must determine within themselves the method of birth control practices that they want to follow. I do think that God expects us to use wisdom as far as uh, the size of our families. And I do not believe that uh, God has intended that uh, intercourse be uh, strictly for the Uh, perpetuation of the human race between husband and wife, but to be a very pleasurable experience between husband and wife, an experience that draws them together. And in Hebrews we read that marriage is honorable among all men and the bed undefiled. And so uh, Paul teaches in Corinthians that uh, there should be a mutual understanding and arrangement between husband and wife as far as the frequency of their intimate relationships. But yet there should not be a prolonged withholding of one from the other uh, lest Satan would move in and, and use that uh, prolonged time as an opportunity to tempt. And so uh, this Scripture here where Onan spilled his seed upon the ground and God slew him, must be taken in its context. It is not an argument against uh, these practices that men have used it as an argument against them, but it is actually because uh, he failed and rebelled against the law of God in raising up a seed uh, for his dead brother. That is why the Lord slew him. And that's why we don't have children in the Sunday evening services. <laughs> because it's good to talk to you on an adult level. And uh, these things are there. There are issues in the Bible and we shouldn't really skirt them. Uh, and I don't know what they did on the radio, but... And the thing which he did, verse 10, displeased the Lord, wherefore the Lord slew him also. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at your father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also as his brothers did. And Tamar went and dwelled at her father's house. Now, Shelah was still a little young to get married. He was the youngest of the three brothers. But Judah, more than that, was fearful. Man, if, if two sons have died... In, in a abortive marriage with this gal, he didn't want to lose all three sons. And so he says, you go home to your father's house and you dwell there. And, and he just sort of forgot her. Just sort of tried to put her out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And uh, uh, just let her go. And now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua... Judah's wife died. So this gal that he married that really wasn't God's choice at all died and she must have been fairly young because uh, Judah was only about 40 years old at this time. And so she must have been fairly young uh, when she died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears. Now it doesn't seem like he spent too much time mourning over her. Uh, I would imagine that the marriage turned into a pretty sad affair. It was not really God's uh, purpose that uh, Shua uh, be in line with the Messiah. She was a Canaanite and no doubt never did convert and uh, began to exercise more and more influence upon the family. And uh, 
the Lord has now removed her at an early age, and um, Jacob was comfort, or, uh, Judah was comforted, and then he headed out for the party of uh, sheep shearing because sheep shearing was always accompanied by big celebration and parties. It was just a fun time of the year, and they would gather together and shear the sheep, and then they'd have a big party. And so he went to Timnath, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. The Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And so she put, on her, she put off her widow's garments, and she covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. Now, the, his, her father-in-law had not been treating her right. Shelah is now a man and he's supposed to be her husband, but they haven't been back to claim her. And so uh, she's going to start to take things in her own hand. Uh, in putting on the veil and sitting in this place, actually she is taking on the guise of a temple prostitute. Uh, among the Canaanite women, it was very common to be a temple prostitute. And even married women were required to give a certain amount of time uh, during their life uh, to serve their God in this way. Because the fertility pros processes were worshipped in their primitive worships of God, their worship ceremonies of God. And so the women were required uh, during times uh, of their life to become temple prostitutes. Uh, they were giving their life, in a sense, to their God uh, and the goddesses of fertility. And so she put on the garbs, the veil of a prostitute and sat in the path on the way to Timnath. Now, when Judah saw her, now it was maybe that she was hoping Sheila would see her and uh, would, uh, then he was the one supposed to marry her anyhow. And uh, she maybe was figuring to catch him, but instead the dad saw her. And of course, his wife is now dead. And so he thought her to be a prostitute because she had veiled her face. And he turned in unto her by the way and said, uh, I pray thee, let me come in to thee. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, How much you give me? And he said, I'll send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Will you give me a pledge till you send it? And he said, What pledge do you want? She said, I'll take your signet and your bracelets and the staff that is in your hand. And so he gave it to her and he came in unto her and she conceived by him. Now this business, what pledge shall I give thee? Interesting, the giving of a ring and a marriage actually comes back to this. The pledge to show sincerity. The pledge was always the purpose to show, I, I've made a promise to you and now to show you that my promise is sincere, I give you a pledge. And so the ring is a pledge to show the sincerity of the agreement or of the promise. It's a guarantee of the promise. And so that's the purpose of, of a ring in a wedding. It's a pledge uh, by which you're guaranteeing the fact that you're going to keep that agreement, that covenant that has been verbally made. And so uh, he... Um, went into her, she conceived, and she arose and went away... And she put the veil from her and put back on her garments of widowhood. And so Judah, embarrassed to come back himself, sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to get his pledge back from the woman. But he could not find her. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where's the prostitute that was sitting here by the side? And they said, There's no prostitute around this place. And so he returned to Judah and he said, I can't find her. And also the men of the place said that there wasn't any prostitute around there. And Judah said, well, let her keep it then. You know, let's not press it any further. I'm embarrassed about the whole scene. And so uh, I at least sent the kid and you haven't found her. So we did what we could. Now it came to pass about three months after that, 
that someone told Judah, Tamer, your daughter-in-law, has played the uh, harlot and she's with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her out and we'll burn her. <laughs> the whole thing with Tamar had been a, 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 a sort of an uncomfortable thing and he probably thought, Oh, I'll finally get rid of her and you know, that's, that's it. No. But he had a surprise coming. <laughs> when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, By the man who owns these, I am with child. And she said, uh, Take a careful look, I pray thee. Uh, do you recognize this signet and these bracelets and this staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. But he knew her not again. But it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that one of them put his hand out and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass as he drew his hand back in that, behold, his brother came out and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called the breach or breaking forth. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand. And they called his name Zara. So twins were born. And again it's interesting. The one seemed to be coming out of the womb. And suddenly retracted his hand and the other was born first because the other was to be the one through which the line of, of Christ was to come. So Shua and her sons are out of the way as far as the line and genealogy to lead to Jesus Christ. And now the genealogy of Christ is going to come through Perez, the son of Tamar. So God finally has things worked around now. Uh, the way He had wanted them, it was a long roundabout process. Uh, and yet God has very interesting ways of working out His plans and His purposes in our lives. So, chapter 38 of Genesis. Why was it put in the record? I don't know. But I'm sure that God had a purpose for putting it in the record. And perhaps one of the purposes is to show that Christ came from just common, ordinary, human, passionate people who are not at all perfect in order that we might be able to better identify with Jesus Christ ourselves because we are plain, ordinary, passionate people far from perfect. And perhaps God is wanting to show how that His purposes can overrule Man's mistakes. Judah in his own flesh going out and choosing Shua as a wife. But God not wanting Shua to have anything to do with the genealogy that will lead to his son. Tamar being God's choice. And so by this roundabout process brings Tamar into the picture so that her son will be the one that will come in the lineage of Christ. Now it is interesting, in Matthew's Gospel, when Matthew traces the genealogy of Christ, there are four women that are mentioned. One of them being Tamar. Of all of the women that were in the ancestry, because there was a woman for every man naturally in the genealogy of Christ, Four women were named. Tamar, Rahab. Now, Tamar was there. She played the prostitute. Rahab was there. She was a professional prostitute. Ruth, who was a Moabitess. And Bathsheba, who became David's wife through very seamy circumstances. And so the four women that are named by Matthew in the genealogy of Christ 
are four of what we would choose to be most unlikely candidates to be in that line that would bring forth the Savior to the world. And they are the four that are mentioned by Matthew.